Well, good morning, everyone. And if you have a Bible, please do keep it open or finger in those two passages in Genesis 1 and Exodus 35. And today we continue our series uh, looking at the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And today I want to focus on the theme of the Spirit as the one who is beautiful and who beautifies us to do beautiful things. The beautiful one who beautifies us to go and do beautiful things. But let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your spirit here. And we pray that you would speak to us, teach us, inspire us. Thank you that you're making us beautiful. That you've put us in a beautiful world that you made. And that you call us to partner with you in beautifying it. And so we bless you, Lord. Amen. Well, I wonder what comes to mind when you hear the word beauty or beautiful. What do you think of? Perhaps a majestic view from the top of a mountain or the mysterious technicolor life under the sea. Or maybe it's your beloved who immediately comes to mind. Or the moment your child was born and life entered its lungs and you broke down crying. Or perhaps for some a grand symphony or a ballet. Or maybe a pure mathematical solution or an exquisite piece of jewellery. I remember I actually teared up the f when friends treated me and Tiffany to a two Michelin starred meal, a long way from the kebab van that I've spent too long in. And uh, it was like swallowing joy, like swallowing joy. Beauty affects us, we feel it, it elicits a woe or a wow, or an oh. Beauty stops us in our tracks. Beauty holds us in that moment. And just for a moment, we forget ourselves. And beauty moves us beyond ourselves. There's something about beauty that is almost transcendental. It causes us to transcend. It moves us. And there is an insatiable desire we're wired, a desire in our human soul for beauty. And whether it's sought in intimacy or creativity or nature or the perfection of an object or a person or an experience, there is a desire in us for beauty. We're hard, hardwired for it. And why is that? I believe it's because we're hardwired for God. And we're made in his image. And he is the altogether beautiful one. And so there is a longing for us, for him. But because we're made in his image and he is the beautiful one who creates beauty, we have a register in our souls for beauty when we see it. I want to make three points this morning. Firstly, God is beautiful. The psalmist prayed, one thing I have asked from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. What a wonderful thing. We've just had a mere glimpse of that in our time of worship here a few moments ago. Just a gazing a glimpse in the presence of God it would be difficult to articulate. It would be difficult to put into words what we felt in our soul. But we sang because we sensed, because we felt, because we drew near to the beautiful one. God is altogether beautiful. He's perfect. Every aspect of his character, every word he utters, every action he performs, every decree he commands, it's all perfection. It's as it should be. There is harmony and integrity and purity, pure 
form beauty. In 987, Prince Vladimir the Great, the ruler of Kiev, decided that he needed one religion that would unite all the peoples of that region, uh, the Rus people, the Russians. And he sent out envoys into all the surrounding nations to explore all the different religions and traditions to find one that he thought might um, cohere, as it were, and, and bring together these disparate and often warring tribes. And they went here and there looking at the religions and then they came back and shared what they saw. And in an 11th century document, it records this. Then we went to Greece. They went to Constantinople. And the Greeks led us to their edifices. It was the cathedral Hagia Sophia. Where they worshipped their God and we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty, and we are at a loss how to describe it. We only know that God dwells among men, and their service to him is fairer than the ceremonies of all the nations. For we cannot forget that beauty. We know not how to tell of it. We don't know how to speak of it. We don't know how to share. We don't know how to convey what we sensed in our spirit as we were there in that place where they worship the God revealed in Jesus. We simply know it was beautiful. And on the basis of that report, Vladimir invited bishops to come and they preached the gospel. He received Christ and all the peoples of the Rus were baptized in the Dnieper River in 988. Beauty. They experienced beauty. They encountered the beautiful one. Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus said, you will see the king in his beauty. And preeminently we see the king in his beauty in Christ Jesus when God is wed to human flesh in virgin womb and grew up among us and there in that life lived and in those words taught and in those miracles performed and in a life laid down in the horror and the anathema of Golgotha and then in the power and the victory of the resurrection we see the beauty of God the king in his beauty but just seeing beauty is never enough. We're, we're not wired just to observe it. We're wired to enter it. There is a longing in our soul to be co-joined with it. And divine beauty evokes desire. And divine beauty beckons us in. It moves us towards it. C.S. Lewis brilliantly wrote, we do not want merely to see beauty, though God knows that is bounty enough. We want something else that can hardly be put into words to be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. What a beautiful thing to observe, and it's so true. It's not just enough to look at it. There is a wiring in our soul made in the image of God. All beauty that we see aligns that flow into the being of God and through Christ we're drawn towards it. And it's God who wants that union and communion too. That union with him in his beauty. And that comes through Jesus. And it comes by the Spirit. And the God in his beauty revealed in the beauty of Jesus dies for us to undo all the ugliness in our lives and the world. And when we look to him by his spirit, he co-joins us by faith to the Father and we're clothed in his beauty. That's the first thing I wanted to share. God is the altogether beautiful one. And then secondly, God creates beauty. I've already made this point, but I'm going to keep making it this morning. 
The first time we encounter God in Scripture is Genesis 1.1. It begins with God. And God is there in the act and action of creating the beautiful universe. He's making beautiful things. The beautiful God is about beauty. And the first time we actually see any reference to the Spirit is Genesis 1 verse 2, the second verse of the Bible, the second sentence. And we read that the earth was formless and void and darkness over the waters of the deep. The ancients in that time thought about the waters as being chaos. They often spoke of it in demonic terms as a great dragon. And the spirit, the Hebrews present the story of God, as it were, by his spirit, hovering. The Hebrew word, there's a very interesting word. It's rokaf, and it's a word that is used of incubation by a bird, nurturing over her eggs, bringing them to, to life. And the spirit hovers over the chaos, over the demonic, as it were, and is bringing forth life. Out of that which is formless, out of the void, it says, the nothingness and the chaos, life and beauty is coming out by the agency of the spirit, by the will of God. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the mind of the creator. The great naturalist and scientist John Muir, some of you would have seen his amazing photography. When we contemplate, he says this, when we contemplate the whole globe as one great dew drop, striped and dotted with continents and islands, flying through space with other stars all singing and shining together as one, the whole universe appears as an infinite storm of beauty. What God does is beautiful. What God makes is beautiful. Last night I read Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. We make it ugly. The fall makes it ugly. Sin can make it ugly. But what he made was beautiful. And it is beautiful. And it's being remade. Christ is coming back for it. You ask any professor here in Oxford, any of the faculties, whether physics or maths or biology or English or music or law, about their work and they will speak often in terms of beauty. They bring an aesthetic into their academic discipline. It's all there. That's why they're studying it, because it captivated them. That one thing captivated, that one little aspect of something in the world that God may captivate them. Maybe you're in a context that seems formless and void, with darkness covering the chaos of the waters. Maybe that's how it is in your soul. Maybe that's how it is in your family. Maybe that's how it is in your work situation. Maybe that's how it is in your relationships. Maybe that's just how it is going on in your mind. Formless, chaos, darkness, void, the shadows. Well, ask the Spirit of God who creates life, who hovers and nurtures and incubates and brings life to bear. Ask him to hover over that area of your life and turn what appears nothing into something beautiful. He can do it. It's what he does. The Spirit changes us to be like Jesus. And he's altogether beautiful. St. Paul said that we are being transformed from one degree of glory into the likeness of Christ and this by the Spirit. The Spirit changes us to look like Jesus, to make us more beautiful. To put down and put away the ugly, the scars and the mars of sin and to change us to be like him. 
Actually, the Greek word that Paul uses is metamorphuo, from which we get metamorphosis, you know, a kind of chrysalis and then a caterpillar into a butterfly. That's the idea. In the medieval era, they talked about the process of becoming like Jesus. They called it beatification. Great word, literally becoming beautiful. And that's what the Spirit does. And you'll know those ugly areas in your life. Those areas perhaps that are marked by the fears and the tears and the wounded years and marred by scars. And ask the Spirit to come today and hover. The Spirit of Jesus to come and hover and heal. A member of our church family recently published a, a semi-autobiographical novel. It was released last week. I bought a copy. And uh, he spent more than half his life in jail. No education formally after 12, but uh, grew up on the streets. A life of great violence and crime and abuse and drugs. And uh, the promo for the book read, Drugs, violence, madness, be warned, this is not for the faint-hearted. Well, I didn't think I was faint-hearted, but it's been a hardcore read, I, I can tell you. He became a Christian a year ago and joined our family when he came out of jail. He's in his 40s, he spent more time in jail in his life than out. And this depicts some of the sordid trauma that he's lived through ugly the ugly side of life really quite shocking I was reading it this week but last Sunday he came to church and I he came over and I, I said to him I said Michael I, I said uh, and he was always he's glowing I said Michael tell me about church and your life now if you had to sum it up in one word what would it be and he just said it's beautiful and he's gone from brutal to beautiful and what a difference Jesus can make I mean he's just a walking he's walking illustration of beauty he's a beautiful man and forever bringing people to church because he wants them to experience it Jesus changes lives and he can change yours no matter where you are and what you're like and where you've been and what you've done and what you're facing. He is beautiful and can change lives. Spirit. And he do, why does he do it? Well, he does it because it comes natural to him. The beautiful one beautifies. And he does it because he loves and he is love. And it's been said we're not loved because we're beautiful. We're beautiful because we are loved. And you're loved infinitely. God is beautiful. He makes things beautiful. And thirdly, he makes us beautifiers. Recently, I was sent a video of a lecture on the Holy Spirit from one of the great living theologians, uh, a former Regis professor of ethics here in Oxford, Professor Oliver O'Donovan. I've got to be honest, for 30 years I've tried reading him. I've never understood him. I'm just a bear of a small brain, and his ideas and concepts are just way out of my league, you know. But something he said, and it was an aside, <laughs> I understood. And I listened to it over and over again. Just trying to make sure I, I, I heard him right. Because I thought it was really important. And it was a distillation, really, of what he was sharing on the Spirit. And he said this, On the one hand, you have an exodus where the Spirit brings out. He brings life out of chaos. Order out of chaos. Beauty out of nothingness. And he says, And then on the other, you have beauty. He brings out and he brings to beauty. He says this, what comes out must be beautiful. I thought O'Donovan, 
I first read you in 91 and I didn't get it then, but now I've got you and I think you're right. He brings us out and then he does something beautiful. The spirit of deliverance, the spirit of exodus, the spirit of redemption, the spirit of freedom, the spirit of liberty, and then the spirit of beauty. And we see this in the book of Exodus from which we had our reading. God's spirit in the fire and the cloud led Israel out of slavery and bondage in Egypt. And having brought them out in a display of majesty and glory and power, then there is beauty. And God comes down amongst them, speaks to them. And God ordains that this tabernacle would be built in the middle. And they have it there in the middle of the Sinai Desert, the temple, a tabernacle. God dwelling with them and it's just outshining in beauty. And it's a place where he does beautiful things. He speaks to them and he guides them and he forgives their sin. And then we had our reading. I'm going to read it again from Exodus 35. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel. Sometimes we don't see who God has chosen and the gifts that he's put on them. But God said through Moses, Look, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, the son of the tribe of Judah. And he filled him with the Spirit of God. And then look at all of these things with wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all kinds of skill and artist, able to do artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze and to cut and set stones and to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. And he's given him both, a, a, given him and this other dude, Aholiab, the ability to teach others. And he filled them with skill. <laughs> to do all kinds of work as engravers and designers and embroiders in these different linens and colored yarns and weavers and skilled workers and designers. Amazing. I mean, they were given a lot of gifts to do a lot of stuff. Amazing. The first reference in the Bible to, the, to God is God creating. The first reference in the Bible to the Spirit is the Spirit creating. The first reference in the Bible to someone filled with the Spirit is creating beautiful things. This is the first reference in the Bible to it. What's the Spirit-filled life look like? Well, this is part of it, that God gives supernaturally natural gifts to beautify the world, to make beautiful things, teaching others with skills and able to make all of this beauty. Ordinary things that become extraordinary by the Spirit gifting these skills of beauty. This is the alchemy of the Spirit. He makes our lives beautiful through Christ and then he gives us gifts to do beautiful things. To take the ordinary and turn it into the beauty. Mother Teresa worked in the slums of Calcutta, as you know, and she gave dignity to the dying and took those untouchables who lived on the streets who were dying with their maggot-infested wounds. And she brought them in and nursed them and prepared them for death. And when she was asked why she did it, she famously, a documentary was made with this title, of her, she said, I wanted to do something beautiful for God. She was a funny egg, if you've ever read the biography. An unusual woman, but she did an amazing work. I wanted to do something beautiful for God. And by the Spirit in us, we then want to, that, the overflow of that is that we want to do something beautiful. And God wants you to do something beautiful for him. To partner with the creative spirit who hovers over chaos and transforms it and brings life and order and substance where there was nothing. And God's spirit has given some of you creative and artistic gifts to beautify the world. 
And God's given some of you intelligence and wisdom to bring ideas and concepts and solutions that advance knowledge and learning that beautify our world. And God has given some of you organizational gifts to make things work and function and grow to beautify our world. And God's given some of you gifts of finance. You can make money, not so that you can have better holidays and live a fatter life, but that you can bless others and beautify the world. And God's given some of you gifts to teach and train and equip and bring skills to others so that they can go on iterating this beauty. And God has given some of you a heart and a mind full of wisdom and empathy and compassion, heart-to-heart skills, so that you can untangle situations and problems and bring healing. And no one's out there who hasn't got something because we're made in God's image and therefore we're given these creative abilities. And your talent becomes a sacrament when it's given back to God and given to bless the world. What has God given you? And how are you using it? I wonder if some of you got pushed into other things, your heart wasn't in it, even your head wasn't in it, but you ended up doing stuff but you weren't playing to your strong suit and your gifting, the things that God gave you to bless and beautify the world. Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. Wrote that late 19th century. Maybe he was thinking about Vladimir of Kiev and knew that beauty came and saved his nation. They need to be saved again. Beauty will save the world. Beauty has saved the world in Christ Jesus through the loveliest life the world has ever known laid down for the sins of the world to reconcile us to God. And God calls all of us whatever gift, whatever talent he has given us also to be those who, as the prophet Isaiah says, have beautiful feet. And you go and carry this beautiful gospel of a beautiful God who wants to make us beautiful and make us beautifiers. Amen.